Welcome to First United Lutheran Church. This is the message from Sunday. It's our prayer that this message touches your heart and helps to guide you in your life. Let's listen. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The title of my message today, No One Can Serve Two Masters, and I borrowed that, of course, from the words of Jesus in this text. Let me ask, uh, I know I quiz my confirmation kids. I know adults don't always like to be quizzed, but this is a brief quiz. I don't think it's too painful. But tell me, true or false, this is a biblical statement. Money is the root of all evil. You don't have to answer out loud. You can if you want. I see some no's, okay. The answer is false. What the scripture says is, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. From 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, let me read that in context, starting with verse 6 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harm, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. Imagine this situation. Someone, maybe a loved one, an aunt or an uncle or a, a parent, will say, I have some resources that I would like you to invest for me. I don't feel confident. I don't feel capable at this time. I'd like you to re invest them for me. And you say, okay, I want to do the best that I can do. And as you give regular reports, you can be reporting, you know, on the short term, this is really yielding well. I, I found some good investments for you, and, and, and the value is going up, and, and I'm so excited, and, and I'm happy for you. And, of course, the response would probably be that they were happy with what you're doing as well. But then over the long term, not only was it not going well, but it was going downhill, and, and, and you lose a lot of the value of the original investment. And you could go up to your mom or dad and say, well, I've got some good news and some bad news, but they probably wouldn't want to hear the good news in light of the bad news. Well, the good news is, for a while, you were making a lot of profit. But the bad news is, you lost your principal. The value went down so much that you lost what you had in the first place. The good news wouldn't be very good compared to that bad news that was so bad. We think that we are the owners of what we have in our hands. That is wrong, according to God's word. We are not the owners. Everything belongs to the Lord. He owns it all, and he entrusts some of it to us to take care of, to watch, to, to care for, and to use as he would have us use it. We're reminded in Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Everything that we have, not just finances, but the, the loved ones, the families, those relationships and friendships that we have, are trust from God. He's given them to us to take care of and to use according to his glory and for the work of his kingdom and for our neighbor's good including our own family. As we look at this passage, again, we recognize from the beginning uh, someone, uh, a pastor who teaches pastors in seminary and teaches them how to preach, uh, made this comment. I heard that, that this, uh, on a podcast this last week. This is one of Jesus' hardest parables to deal with and to understand because it seems like this steward or this manager did so many bad things and Jesus is commending not everything that he did, but he's commending the one thing that he did. And, and in parables, we look for the, the one point of comparison, the one uh, point of the illustration. And if we go too far into the parables, we kind of get off track and, and off the subject. But we see in verses 1 through 8, we see that Jesus tells a parable about an unrighteous steward or an unrighteous manager. And I'll be using the word steward more than manager. Um, again, the, the same idea or similar idea. Uh, but we'll talk about what a steward is in, in just a moment. In verses 1 and 2, we see the steward having a day of reckoning. He was told, uh, the, sorry, his, uh, his master was told, uh, 
that he had been, the steward had been squandering his possessions. And he called him and said, what is this I hear about you? Give account of your management, for you can no longer be management, a manager. He can no longer be steward. The term here that's used would be someone that would be take care, taking care of the a family or a household's income and, and finances and the expenses and, and taking care of all those things. It could also apply to a, a business situation as well. Someone that was given that responsibility. The word here is, is the word that gives us the, the word in English for economy or economics. He's taking, it's the house law. It, it's taking care of the property and, and making sure the purchases are made and, and everything that is needed is provided for. What is a steward? A steward is a, 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 or, or a manager is one who is entrusted to care for the property or the goods of someone else, to act on their behalf for their good. Who is a steward according to the word of God? It's each one of us. Not only believers, but those who are unbelievers are also stewards of, of God's gifts. And, and sometimes they use it well, sometimes they don't. Sometimes Christians use their stewardship well, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes in church we talk, to, talk about stewardship just as giving. Maybe once a year we have a stewardship campaign, and certainly that's part of it, but it's not just our money. It's our time, it's our talents, it's our resources. We have the steward's dilemma in verse 3. What shall I do? My master's taking the management away from me. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. Verses 4 through 8, we see the steward's decision. He came up with an idea, and the first part of that was to settle debts to the borrower, borrower's benefits. Again, he was told, basically, you're fired. You have, you have to give account. He didn't have the legal right to make the decisions that he made. Again, please, Jesus is not saying it's proper to misuse your business opportunities. That, that's not the point of the parable here. But the steward decided to settle those debts that his master had in, for the benefit of those who were borrowing. And he called each one in, one by one. How much do you owe my master, was his question. And the um, NIV translates it into American measures, which is good. Originally, the idea was 100 measures of oil. And he said, make that 50 measures. It's a 50% reduction. If you're... Someone that you owed money to said, you know, if you paid off your bill this month, I'll cut it in half. You know, that would be probably pretty easy to come up with some extra money to save a good portion on what you owe. A second one was called in. How much do you owe 100 measures of wheat? Again, the NIV translates it into, into uh, American measurements. Take your bill and write 80. A 20% reduction. Not as good as the first deal and and... Some may ask why it's a different percentage. Could be the value of, of what uh, was there might have been the same. But from 100 measures of wheat down to 80. Not only did he set all the debts to the benefit of the borrowers. I'll make it better for you. And someone pointed out today, but pastor, that was kind of selfish. He's saying, I, I want my life to be better, so I'm going to give a, a good deal to, to other people. And again, Jesus wasn't commending everything that he did. But he was helping those who owed his master money. He was making their life easier, making their situation more pleasant. But secondly, we see in verse 8, he was settling debts to the benefit of his master's reputation. So not only was he helping those who owed his master money, but he was acting on behalf of, of his master, even though he didn't have that legal right anymore, but acting in a way that would make his master look good. How could the master, after he found out everything, and people were so grateful to him, you're so kind, thank you for your kindness to me. It would have been embarrassing for him to say, well, actually, I take back what my steward did for me. It was settling debts to his master's benefit. And for that, the master commended him. He praised the unrighteous manager because he acted shrewdly. Because he acted shrewdly. Again, 
Jesus used the word an unrighteous steward or an unrighteous manager. He wasn't saying everything he did was, was good, but he pointed out that he acted shrewdly. He was looking to the future. He was doing what was beneficial in, in some ways to, to the people who owed money as well as to the one who was owed that money. And then Jesus gives some application. He acted shrewdly, for the sons or the children of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons or children of light. These two groups are the groups that Jesus mentions in, in his application. Verse 8, the second part of it, he compares these two groups, the children of the world, literally the sons of this age, or literally the sons of this eon, and the sons of the light, or the children of light. These are the two groups, believers and unbelievers. Jesus said, for the children of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. Again, that's a rebuke to those who are believers. Sometimes as believers, we're not the best managers or stewards of our time or our resources. Sometimes people of the world who don't know Jesus have better insights into some things than, than we do. It doesn't mean we quit. It doesn't mean we give up. It means that we strive to be wise. We want to learn. We want to continue to, to, to understand how to best use our resources, our time, our talents. Jesus declares the first of these two groups to be more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the children of light in dealing with the children of this age. And then he challenges the children of light, that is, those who are believers, to be shrewd. He wants us, again, not to be dishonest, but to be wise, to be careful, to understand how to use all that we've been given for God's glory, for his kingdom, and for the good of our neighbor. And our neighbor begins in our own household, of course. Jesus says, make friends by means of wealth. Please, it, it's always wrong to manipulate people. It's always wrong to use our wealth or our power, our authority, to manipulate people to do something that's not good, it's always wrong. It's always sinful. We should never do that. But to use our wealth to help others, to meet basic needs of those who are in desperate need, to help those who have opportunities to, to do something to serve other people, Jesus says to make friends by means of our wealth. Our, our wealth can be a tool or it can be an idol. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're warned, I'm sorry, chapter 6, we're warned uh, uh, that many people have fallen from the faith because of their hunger and desire to be wealthy. You know what? You, you can be wealthy. Again, it's not wrong in and of itself. But I've seen people who become wealthy at the expense of their marriage, at the expense of the, their relationship with their children. They lose their family to gain material possessions. And those things don't last. When God gives them to us, he gives them to, uh, to us to use, to use properly for his honor and glory. Our wealth can be a tool or it can be an idol. It can be a tool that God uses for his honor and glory, for our good, for the good of others. When we give to our local church, when we give to and pray for missions around the world, those are good opportunities for us to be part of, aren't they? Those are investments that, that truly are, are investing treasure in heaven. And even though the stock market, I believe, is a, a good place to invest money, and over the years, generally, the stock market averages about 10%, but there are some bad years, aren't there? Maybe you've known someone, especially in the California real estate market, back in, the, in, in 2012 or so, where people thought the prices keep going up and up and up. And people were getting wealthy, and, and people were going beyond what they normally would have do, uh, done from a, a, a wise business point of view, just assuming it's always going to be this way. And then when the bottom drop, uh, dropped out of the market, a lot of people lost a lot of things. To be involved in, in supporting, 
prayerfully and, and by our gifts and, and even sometimes going ourselves to be involved in missions, supporting the work of church planting around the world, supporting the work of evangelism and discipleship and training of national teachers and workers are, are good things for us to do, good uses of our resources. Not that that's all or that's the only thing we're going to do, but there are many opportunities and, and that would be one in particular. Jesus said, make friends by means of wealth. And then he said, when it fails, they will receive you. If you invest in the work of the gospel, if people are hearing the word of God, coming to penitent faith in Christ, what does that cost? I like giving away Bibles. I think it's fun. I love when someone's reading the Word of God, maybe someone that didn't have God's Word before that point, and when they have questions and they like to find out more and understand what they're reading. Do we look at the price tag on the Bible? Oh, it's a lot of money. Or investing in, the, in, in our youth or investing in our confirmands. You know, that's a chunk of money to pay for their books. And I say that's a pretty good investment, isn't it? to get God's word into the hands of, of people, especially our young people. I don't care what it costs. That's me personally. I'm not saying you have to agree with me, but I think it's a worthwhile investment. Jesus said, so that when, and the word here, there are two different words in, in Greek for when, and one is when, and it's a certain time. Jesus talked about when the Son of Man comes, again, in glory to judge the living and the dead, then he talks about that, the details in Matthew 25. And the when there is a definite, specific time, we don't know when that will be, but we know that there will be a day when Jesus comes back to judge the living and the, and the dead. But here the word that he uses here is when, that's an indefinite word. And the idea is whenever that happens. We don't know when our wealth will fail, but whenever it does. Jesus says if, if we're investing in people, if we're sharing the gospel, if we're encouraging and, and supporting the, the work and ministry of, of those that are reaching out with the gospel to people that need to hear it. Even when our wealth on this earth fails, Jesus talks about that we'll be received by many into eternal dwellings. Going on to verses 10 through 15, for the believer in Jesus, Jesus calls you to manage that which does is, which is not truly belong to you until you receive that which is your own. The first time I heard a pastor preach on this text was when I was in college. And that was a surprise to me. What, what I have is not mine, and I didn't have much in college. But what I had wasn't really mine. But it was something entrusted to me. And right now, during our lifetime, we are tested with what we have. In verse 10, this will either show faith, faithfulness or unrighteousness in terms of how we use it. Jesus said in verse 10, he was faithful in a very little thing, is faithful also in much. And he was unrighteous in a very little thing, is unrighteous also in much. You might think, I don't have a lot of wealth. I don't have, I have a lot of personal things. And you might say, if, if only I had more, then my life would be better. But again, the challenge for each one of us is whatever financial wealth, whatever talents, whatever abilities we have right now, we can use those for the kingdom of God. We can use those to serve and, and to show love, the love of Christ to our neighbors. We can acknowledge that sometimes we fall short and sometimes we say, you know what, I, I really need this new thing because I have a collection of things and, and I just need the newest thing to go along with these other things that, that just pile up in my house. And maybe you guys don't have thing collections, but I have way too many. Every time I've left a church, I've, I've donated some of my books in my library to the church that's there. And one of my friends, as I was leaving a church in Iowa, he said, Dave, do you really want to get rid of these books? And I said, Scott, don't, don't, don't make it harder for me because I'm a book collector. It's easy for the things that we collect to become idols for us or the, the things that we pile up to say, well, this is important or, or it's so important I just need a newer one. 
verses 11 and 12, the stewardship is not managing what belongs to us, but what truly belongs to the Lord. The stewardship is not managing what belongs to us. It's not my stuff that, that I'm taking care of. Again, I, I still use that terminology sometimes, but ultimately recognizing that it's what the Lord has entrusted to me. It makes it easier sometimes when, when there's a need and, and I, I say, you know what, I have this and here's this need over here and maybe what I have needs to meet this need. That's not always easy, is it? It's not always easy. Stewardship is not managing what belongs to us, but what belongs to the Lord. And then Jesus talks about true riches in verse 11. If you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you true riches to you? If you're Bill Gates or someone else that has a lot of money, guess whose money that is? Please, Bill Gates has worked hard. He's come up with some good ideas, and I'm not faulting that at all. But even the wealth that Bill Gates and his wife have, it's God's that he's given to them to use to help others. True riches is not what we have in our hands right now. It's what those things that will last for all of eternity. Personal wealth, if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is in others, who will give you that which is your own? Again, that promise of of we might be wealthy, even though we might not be wealthy in, in an earthly sense, but in, in heaven we'll have true wealth. In the forgiveness of sins that we have in Christ, we have that wealth that's beyond any monetary value that we might have. And then in verse 13, either God will be your master or material wealth will be your master, but not both at the same time. It's an either or. It's an either or, not a both and. God or wealth will be your master. Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters, for either, either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Again, you might have multiple jobs. You might be working full-time, plus having some side jobs as well. And in our culture, that works. But if you're a slave, if, you're, if you have a master, you don't have two masters. You have one, and you're at that person's disposal. Uh, disposal uh, in, in your life and in your time. God or wealth will be your master, one or the other, but not both. Jesus said you cannot serve God and wealth. The old word in the King James is, is mammon, which comes from the Aramaic. It's a personification of, of wealth. Either you bow down and worship the living and the true God, or you're bowing down and worshiping wealth or mammon, material things that don't endure. One or the other, but not both. Then in verses 14 and 15, we see the Pharisees were worldly-minded, and notice their unbelief demonstrated in this way. They were scoffing at Jesus' words, making fun of what Jesus said. Jesus, uh, Luke says in verse 14, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. They were scoffing at Jesus. They were scoffing at his teaching. Yeah, right. A lot of good that would do us, whatever else they might have been saying, but hearing the truth but rejecting it. Jesus said they were also justifying themselves before people but not before God. To be justified is to be declared righteous. And they were showing themselves to be righteous. Look at if anyone's good enough to get into heaven, it would be the Pharisees, at least from their perspective. And for a lot of people, they would look at the Pharisees and say, I could never be like them. I could never be that good. But Jesus said that they were justifying themselves before people, but ultimately not before God. It wasn't God saying about the Pharisees that they were righteous. And furthermore, they were rejecting kingdom values. Jesus said, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. The things that we run after sometimes, the things that we think, I just have to have these things, in God's kingdom, those values are upside down. God's kingdom values are right side up, but the values of the world are upside down. 
when my wife and I were missionaries to Brazil, we heard from some of the parents, uh, some of their younger, uh, some of their older children uh, came down and, and helped in, in Brazil on a couple different occasions, came down on some summer teams. And in one case, we heard from a mother who said, you know, every year at the beginning of the school year, our daughter goes to, to uh, go wardrobe shopping for school, getting ready for the next year. And she said, you know what happened this year with our daughter? We talked about going to the store, and she said, you know what, I, I'm just going to get one white blouse. I don't need any more than that. Because she had been working with people that didn't have very much at all. And the little bit that she thought she had was a whole lot more than a lot of other people in the world have. And it helped put that into perspective. You know what, I don't need to add to my wardrobe very much because there's enough there already. Let me conclude a longer conclusion than probably normal, but I'll try and be as brief as I can. Don't be like a Pharisee. Don't be like the Pharisees who are bowing down to a God of money. They loved money. And that love of money kept them from listening to Jesus and trusting in him. Do not fear love or trust in, in money above all things. That is only God is worthy of that attitude and that behavior. You've heard this expression before, but let me repeat it. Don't use people and love things. Don't use people and love things, but rather use things and love people. Things are there, those things that God has given to us are there for us to enjoy, but not just for us. God gives those things to us so that we can serve and help other people, that we can provide for our own family first and foremost, but also to help other people in need, other people in various situations of life. Again, we're reminded in, in life that we're called to be stewards or managers of God's possessions. What I have is not really mine. What I have is what I've been called to take care of for God and for the sake of his kingdom. Remember this parable, about, uh, the parable of Jesus about the steward or this manager who is called to give account of his management. And remember, I know this is not Minnesota nice, but... It's something that the text is, is reminding us of. Remember that you are like that manager who managed poorly. You have not always managed what God has given you well. Sometimes you've used it selfishly because you work hard and you deserve it. Forgetting that sometimes God gives you something not for you to hang on to, but for you to pass on to someone else. Sometimes we have to admit that we've misused the resources that God has given us. And at that time, we go back to the promise that we heard earlier in the service. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us or cleanse us from all and every unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus that not just cleanses us one time when we first become a Christian, but daily as we see how we fall short, we acknowledge that, confess that. As we offend other people, we confess to them. I have hurt you in this way, please forgive me. As we sin against God, we confess to him. We find forgiveness for our sins only in Jesus and in his once for all time sacrifice for our sins. Going on, looking back at the parable, you are called to manage God's possession for advancing his kingdom, not merely for your own pleasure, pleasures and desires. Again, in the Christian life, there's that balance of, of we can enjoy all that God has given us, but recognizing that that's not the end in itself. God gives us things for us to enjoy, but also for us to be able to serve others in those areas. You're called to manage what, is, what does not truly belong to you until that time when you receive what is truly your own, and that will be in heaven. Where do we use our stewardship in, in what areas of life? And, and these are some of the things that I've come up with, not unique to me, certainly by, by any means, but some of our vocation, some of our callings in life. And, and our calling is not just where we work, but it's the different uh, relationships that we have in our family, in our church, in our employment, in our community. In our family, we have husband and wife and the stewardship uh, that, that they have with each other, parents and children, sibling and sibling, grandparents and grandchildren, you can add other relationships there. In our church, we have a relationship with our Redeemer and those who are redeemed, those who are cleansed by the blood of Christ. We have pastor and parishioner. 
We have member and member. We have member and visitor. Even greeting people and welcoming them to our service. Finding out more about them and appreciate the interaction that, that you guys have in, in so many different areas, at times of fellowship and, and greeting each other and, and making each other feel welcome. And that's valuable, isn't it? In our employment, employer and employee, employee and customer, in our community, neighbor with neighbor, not just the ones that live right next to you, but other, other people in our community, rulers and citizens, teachers and students, many opportunities where we have to, to live out our faith and to, to carry out in our vocation what God has called us to, to be stewards of all that he's given us, his time, his talents, his treasures, for his honor, for his glory, for our neighbor's good, and for the furtherance of his kingdom. May we be faithful in the stewardships that he's given to us. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from First United Lutheran Church.